You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Welcome to a series called The Leadership Challenge. I'm John Scott, and this is an INCJ podcast and YouTube. There are many different leadership roles in the justice systems system and many leadership styles and issues. At INCJ, we want to give people a conversational opportunity to explore what it's like to be a leader by asking questions and seeing where the answers take us. So we've started a conversation with many different criminal justice leaders to ask about their experiences Our hope is that sharing answers will help find solutions and fresh ideas about improving the system that we work in. If you want to follow the series, you'll find it on our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or on Twitter at INTCJ Network. The title of this podcast is International Strategic Leadership in Criminal Justice. Well, thank you very much for joining us and listening. Let me introduce today's guests, Jana Spero, who is Secretary General of the CEP, that's the Confederation of European Probation, and Gustav Talving, who is Executive Director of Europris, the Organization for Prison Services Across Europe. Now, it's brilliant to have two such senior people coming together to discuss leadership and strategy. Thank you very much for giving us the time in such hectic schedules, and welcome to you both. Now, rather than me tell everybody about you, let's get you to introduce yourselves, and let's find out about how you ended up in your respective jobs. So, Jana, how about you tell us about your professional background and how you found yourself sitting in the role of Secretary General of CEP? No, thank you so much, John, uh, and hello uh, to Gustav and to all podcast listeners. Well, um, I'm originally from Croatia, and I'm a lawyer. Don't run away. Don't turn the radio <laughs> off. And uh, when I started my career, I started in the Ministry of Justice of Republic of Croatia, and I was involved in international cooperation in the criminal matters. And um After uh, some time, uh, I had a privilege that I was one of the people who were developing probation service in Croatia. We are one of the young probation services in Europe. And this was like a an, an great role, you know, when you start something from the beginning and then you have opportunity to learn from different experiences. And the way we decided was to go to see internationally what's happening And this is where I started uh, working with the CEP uh, and with uh, different countries that gave us idea how to shape uh, our country. So my connections with CEP started on the day one when my professional life went into probation world. And I worked for 17 years in the Ministry of Justice. Last five years, I was a Director General for Prison and Probation Service of Croatia. And maybe to highlight, I was the first female ever in this role uh, for a prisons in uh, Croatia. And after five years of this very challenged uh, job, I found myself in a situation where there was a position of Secretary General in CP, and I knew that this was something that was next step in my career. And uh, as I started as somebody who was very involved in CP events, uh, then I, I was three years board member and three years I was a vice president of CP. So this was for me like a logical evaluation in my career. And today I'm here. I started in September last year and I'm very proud to be representing CP. Okay. Now then, Gustav, do you, do you have similar roots in the profession of prisons? Thank you so much, John. Uh, good morning and uh, good morning, all listeners and viewers. Um, well, I have a slightly different background, I think. Uh, and uh, I took sort of the long turn into uh, international cooperation. So I, I'm a sociologist uh, for training. Uh, and uh, um, in my student years, I worked in a remand prison. 
and that sort of caught my interest and and I was sort of turning more and more into criminology uh, and uh, um, after my graduation I actually applied for a job in probation in Stockholm in Sweden where I where I'm from uh, and uh, uh, I really enjoyed working in probation it's it's a fantastic uh, let's say institution and uh, of course <clears throat> the best alternative for most uh, offenders i would say so so i think uh, that was a very valuable time for me and at that time international cooperation was not even on the map you know I, I, no one really talked about anything else than even like the stockholm region uh, so even the national perspective was was absent uh, after a few years in probation, I, I started working in training academy, training probation, probation officers and prison officers. And then the national perspective came in, of course, with standards and, you know, national policies, etc. Uh, but it was first in 2007 when I started working in the head office with research and development, where the international field sort of opened up to me. And uh, after a few years, I was appointed national representative for a project called prisons of the future and this uh, of course caught our interest and uh, this was actually coordinated by the netherlands so i was here in the hague uh, first time in uh, 2012 i think uh, for this project and this sort of opened up uh, many relationships also with europris actually which was part of this project so that was my my sort of uh, entrance into international cooperation and ever since then i've been sort of a big fan of of uh, european cooperation and and uh, sort of trying to bring this also into my um, positions uh, that i had in in the swedish service to bring the international perspective into um the the development of operations but what do you think this additional dimension of an international perspective gave to your understanding of the job? I think that uh, um, there are so many solutions out there uh, that can be uh, inspiring, not maybe as a copy-paste format, but you can definitely see that on any level you can get inspiration and empowerment by meeting others. And I also have experience from working in uh, much poorer countries like Haiti and Somalia. And even there you can see things and innovation solutions that um, that sort of are mind-blowing in terms of, of uh, being very sort of pragmatic and, and life-saving sometimes. So, so that could also be a, a relevant input, even for a very high-developed service like the Swedish one, for example. Okay, that's great. So can we perhaps look at the purpose of both your organizations? Because it's good, before we talk about collaboration, to think about what the organizations themselves do. So let's start with you, Gustav. What's the, what would you say the purpose of Europris? Although I noticed that you've got a sign be, beside your head that says. So what's the purpose of Europris? Well, the purpose of Europris is fairly simple. Uh, Europris is a member organization. And uh, uh, a prison service joins Europris to improve their knowledge normally uh, and to exchange experience and practice with their fellow prison professionals. So that, that's the main uh, objective of Europris, to, to, to be a platform for European prison services. Um, but what we also do is that we promote this rights-based and humane and also rehabilitation-oriented incarceration. So this is sort of the values that we build our, our, our work on. Um, moreover, I would say that um, we have the role, or the, uh, the role emerged, I would say, after getting all this sort of support from our members, that we are now the, the voice of them uh, in the Council of Europe and also towards the European Commission. But that has sort of emerged over the years, of course, with the support of our members. And uh, last but not least, I would also like to mention that um, uh, we are connecting with a wide network of criminal justice professionals. So it's not only prisons, but also judiciary, probation, 
researchers and policymakers on different levels. So, so it's a very wide network um, connecting and trying to provide uh, the best services possible for our members. That's really clearly put. Thank you. So now let's switch to ask the same question about CEP. Um, what would you say was the purpose of your organization, Jana? Well, Confederation of European Probation, we are an umbrella organization for probation institutions in Europe. We are a network organization, and we like to say that uh, we are gathering the probation family. So uh, we like to call ourselves the family because it's all about learning and sharing best experiences. For us, that is the crucial that we are connected, all the practitioners, managers, decision makers, but uh, also it's very important to say in the criminal just in the criminal justice field because we need to work together so for cp today it's very important that uh, we unite probation organizations all over the europe and there are differences between the countries but it's most important that we share the values and that we have the common goal because the offender today here, tomorrow is there. So it's very important that we have values that are common, no matter of the differences between different organizations. Also for us, it's very important to professionalize the sector of probation. This is why we have a lot of different activities aiming to professionalization that can come to every probation officer and the manager in our uh, member countries. And we want to raise the profile of probation in the global arena of criminal justice systems. And just like Gustav said, we are the eyes and the ears for the European Commission and the Council of Europe Europe in the field where we work with the professionals, where we can hear their needs, where we can spread the word about what's important and how to continue. So this is very important. And uh, we use our events for connecting people. Uh, we are doing a project that are connecting different countries and uh, giving some results that can be benefit for everyone. And what is very important to say, there is no copy paste that's learning from each other. And even um, when you are doing a project as an expert, every time when you go somewhere, you bring something back home. So it's always two way road of uh, sharing the best practices, but also sharing what doesn't work so that we can uh, help somebody to avoid something that has already been shown not to be the best practice. So that's very important. I notice you both used um, the phrase not copy pasting. Uh, the idea that uh, just because something works, let's say in Croatia, um, you can't just um, lift it up and drop it into another, into another uh, society. So valuing difference, uh, perhaps learning what the principles are, is, is that uh, is that also part of listening and learning? Yes, absolutely. Because uh, as I said, you need to know the differences between the countries. There is a cult, uh, there is a different culture. There are different issues, different even uh, criminal codes. But so the connection is the value the value behind it. And then uh, the good idea doesn't have to be copy paste, but you get the idea and then you tailor made it for your own needs. So maybe if um, I can give one example, it's like, of course, you know about Oasis and uh, when we needed the assessment tool in Croatia, well, we took the idea of Oasis, but then we made Croasis as we called it in uh, as a joke because you need to tailor made it to what your service needs. But the good idea is what gives you that first inspiration to do something good that yeah. is evidence-based. Okay, that, that, that's that's really interesting. Uh, Oasis, just in case people don't know, uh, was a system developed in the UK. And there's always a danger in imposing um, things that might be relevant in one country and assuming that they can just transfer. Thank you. Can I just uh, add something to Jana's comment? Please do, yes, of course. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very well put. Uh, and I just want to add that sort of uh, relating to the theme of, of today's podcast that in terms of strategy, uh, uh, the the sort of um, the context uh, um, 
the context awareness is so important in terms of strategy because you can see successful uh, projects and solutions all over the world. Uh, but in any case, even if it's a very well researched, uh, let's say, method or similar, it stands and falls with your implementation. So, so you need to be very aware of uh, your 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 conditions and possibilities to implement methods and technologies. Otherwise, it might backfire and and be a strategic, let's say, failure. So that's very important, I think. Really strong point. And my suspicion is that our wise listeners will be, will be writing that down very carefully. Thank you. Let's uh, look at the, your specific roles and maybe how you interpret those. You've got very different titles. So one's called, um, I think, an executive uh, director and the other uh, secretary general. And I'm wondering if those titles themselves maybe speak about different history. Uh, do they speak about a different role? So let's let's start with Jana because um, uh, I mean Europris is a, is a relatively younger organization. So let's should we should we let Jana go first because CEP has been around longer? Good stuff. <laughs> Sure, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, where did, what, what, does Secretary General mean something different in terms of leadership, Jana? Well, I don't think so. It's just that CEP was established in 1981. As you said, we are in our 40s and uh, Secretary General was uh, uh, at the time the role that meant like a leadership and the role of um, well, I can say that my role is a bridge between the board, which is very important for Confederation of European Probation, consisting of the president, uh, now Annie Devos from Belgium, two vice president and board members, all from different uh, member countries. I'm the bridge with the, uh, with our members and the practitioners between the board, but also like an artery in, you know, this uh, exchange of the ideas, values and uh, recommendation. And also um, then it's, uh, it's my role to lead the CP office of this uh, part that is or uh, that is organizing all different events and activities that we have through here, because we are really, we are really very engaged in the different topics that are important for the members from the mental health, radicalization, um, electronic monitoring, you name it, everything that is important for our members, we have something about it. We run a lot of expert groups, we have a webinars, we have workshops, conferences. So constantly, this is a, a lot of activities that need to be maintained. So it's like uh, being... Um, being a skipper on a, on a boat, you need to really take into account uh, everything that your crew needs, that your uh, passengers need, the winds. And so it is very important uh, to to be here and to be this kind of a bridge between everyone. Mm. I mean, the Secretary General has an overtone uh, of the United Nations, doesn't it? That idea of um, bringing... Uh, very disparate, different sorts of organisations together and providing organisation, but also that general role, that leadership role. So perhaps that way, that's the best parallel. Um, OK, so executive director, what does that mean, Gustav? Well, <clears throat> executive director is maybe a bit more... Um, uh, direct role, uh, even though the, the tasks and responsibilities are very similar between me and, and Jana, I think. Uh, but in terms of, let's say, terminology, uh, executive director is a quite common term to use for NGOs and other nonprofits, uh, which is actually being the CEO of the organization. So I'm the chief executive officer reporting to the board, uh, providing the best conditions for the board to do their job and to provide the best conditions for my team to do their job. So that is basically what I do uh, on a daily basis. Um, and uh, um, if I extend my mission, so to say, as a sector director, I would say that uh, sort of in line with the mission of Europe is if I do my job well, 
uh, our members will also do their job better. So, so this is sort of linked also to the performance of our members at the end of the day. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I'm interested, who supports you in your role? Are you isolated a figure? Because one of the things about being a leader is that you can end up being a, a solo player. Where does your support come from, Gustav? I, I must admit that, that it is a fairly lonely role. Uh, you have to be strong in this role. Uh, you're sort of exposed to a lot of temptations, a lot of requests, a lot of uh, uh, criticism sometimes also in the directions you take with your organization. Uh, and you need to be very clear about your vision and have a good support. So, uh, but still in, in the European context, working with prisons at least is a fairly uh, lonely position it's it's not that there are many similar uh, organizations or uh, that i have colleagues like you know next door that i can go talk to so so uh, we have this platform called the uh, criminal justice network platform europe and and that that platform is for me has from day one been very valuable and that is jana spero and and Edith Turts from the European Forum on Restorative Justice. We, the three of us, we are sort of teaming up together. And, and I find this collaboration also on management level very supportive. So that, that's been a, like a lifesaver for me <laughs> sometimes because you really need to reach out to, to your, let's say, fellow colleagues uh, with questions that are not maybe relating to the board's work or the team. So you need some people on the same level as yourself. So I find that network very uh, supportive. Mm. What, about, what about in your role, Jana? Uh, do you feel the same level of uh, being a well, solo player? Well, it it depends on what are we talking. Gustav really explained this nicely. It's I have a, a really excellent um connection with the CP president and presidium with vice presidents and of course with the board so it's about the planning about the strategy about the values and deciding on where we want to go with the organization on the other hand um, it's also very important to have a colleagues like Gustav who are more on this other side on our uh, own administrative uh, things that we need to do as an NGO working internationally it's very good to have somebody who's doing the same job so you can ask just for some advice about uh, different uh, topics but it's um it's always uh you know also good to to cooperate and just talk with uh, different colleagues from uh, different countries because good ideas always come from a variety of different uh, places so i think that um in the probation international world, I can say that I have more than colleagues. I found myself a friend for life. So this is something that is very impor important for me. This is like, uh, it's a very nice place to work. Although it's with so much diversity, people coming from far away, but you can really feel comfortable uh, working here. Okay, so... Do you think that friendship is based on having the same values or the same job tasks? Well, absolutely. When when you find somebody who's uh, sharing your values and understands exactly the job that you are doing, it's very easy to connect. And as I said, the probation world is very open-minded and the opened. I always like to highlight that we don't see each other as... Uh, uh, we are not competitive. We are like more like help-oriented which is really the focus and the meaning of the probation when we work with the client, but also happens with the professionals. It's like you feel that you want to help your colleague if you know how to do something. You you want to be there for them. This is my feeling, and I had this on uh, different levels of my work. I told you when I started building the probation service in Croatia, I really felt good in the arms of this probation family. And then when I when when I grew up in this world and when I had the role to help some 
new kids. It was for me so important to be there for them and to share my experience. And really, this is this is a very nice. I really feel comfortable working with my colleagues. Okay, so we're going to move to um, a less uh, supportive and feelings aspect of the job, and maybe to more of a um, a head aspect of the job, which is uh, developing strategy. Now, um, quite often when people are very busy, it's the strategy aspects of the job which get put to one side or or, or left. Um, and you are in big international roles. And I want to ask you both about how important developing strategy is to your job. Um, so perhaps let's, as, let's stay with you, Jana. Um, so is the big picture uh, developing strategy, is that something you spend much time on? Yes, it's very important because like you said in the beginning, John, the schedule for international organization is very tight. So you need to really be careful to know what's your strategy, that you can develop a really good program because there are many topics and a variety of ideas that you need to calculate in your daily, monthly, yearly and uh, long-term agenda. And you have to bear in mind that we have a different audience and you need to be prepared for a variety of different things because it's not the same if you talk with the decision makers, if you are on uh, some very international thing or you are working some training for the first row practitioners. So you need to be prepared for everything and you need to know what is most important topic for your members. You need to assist them. It's not about you. It's about them, what they need because we are here for our members, for our users. And of course, then you have to plan inside your strategy that you need to be flexible because like past few years showed us whatever we plan, we still need to have a room for flexibility because the pandemics occur and things like that. So this is just, you know, you need to know where you go, but you still need to know that maybe you will have to adapt all your plans. Mm, I, I, that's, that's beautifully put. Let's let ask um, from a Europe's perspective, Gustav, uh, how important is developing strategy to your job? Well, I mean, I, I agree with, with all the things that Jana uh, said. I, I think what she's uh, describing is uh, strategy alignment. So your your organization needs to be aligned with the strategy that you set out. Uh, otherwise, you might drive off the road quite easily, uh, especially with a small organization. Uh, and as I mentioned, a lot of requests and uh, wishes from members and other stakeholders that you should do this and you should do that. But it's very important to have this strategy also uh, agreed with your board and your team so so you can sort of drive the ship in in one direction and not in turning constantly um uh, so i would also say that uh, strategy can be uh, sort of more of a deductive process where you agree on objectives and then you identify activities etc but it can also be emerging so strategy is i would say always emerging you, and that, I think that also what Jana is describing, that you have sort of emerging issues and you need to include them in your strategy. You can't sort of say, well, we have this strategy for years uh, and we this is not a topic in our strategy. <laughs> well, I mean, it's relevant to our members and it's emerging, so you need to address it, you know. So it's 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 always like this interplay between having a steady course and being able to include new influences, I think. Yeah. Do you, uh, as organizations, have a written strategy? I will start yeah. with you, uh, uh, Gustav. Yes, we do. We do. We have a four-year strategy plan, uh, and uh, it's uh, uh, divided into four different objective areas. Uh, it's on our website, europress.org, uh, and uh, it will be reviewed next year to be implemented uh, again, a new strategy from 2025 and onwards. 
And what about you, Jana? Do you have a written strategy? Yes, SEEP also has a written strategy very similar, like a Europris that is also available. And and do members find that useful? So that do they refer to it in discussions and uh, that sort of thing? Well, definitely we talk about it when we have a general assembly. This is every three years when we gather all our members, which is a very important event for CEP. And then uh, we decide together about the, the common strategy. So we talk about... Um, big things happening that can knock strategy of course that obviously like uh, the outbreak of a war or or the pandemic with the external things that can upset strategy uh but what other challenges to strategy do you think can can knock you off course Well, the challenges are uh, like what we mentioned, the things that you cannot predict that just uh, keep us uh, with our eyes open where you need to decide how to work under new conditions. And then there is also some uh, new things. If you have a long term strategy, something that you didn't predict would be a topic like Gustav just said. But uh, actually, and also it's very important to have a support from a member. It's important to have uh, stable uh, finances in order to do everything that you plan. So there are there are many factors, but when you are preparing your organizational documents, you always have to think about uh, all these challenges ahead and, and you always have to have a plan B. And if the plan B doesn't work, there's a lot of letters in alphabet, you know, so you have to have a plan C, D and, you know, Gustav, do you agree with me? I completely agree, and 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 uh, uh, I think that that sort of divide you made, John, uh, when you in, sort of introduced this question, maybe it's a little bit artificial. I don't think strategy is only about brains. Actually, it's also about values, because as Jana is saying, when you're sort of facing a crisis, it's sort of your, the values that guides you. So. That's why it's so important in our type of organizations to have a constant discussion about values and what are we stand what we stand for because that is what will guide you when COVID or something else hits you, you know. Uh, and also, a value is not only about human rights and these kind of things. Of course, they are core values of our organizations, but also the let's say what we started this, this this discussion about what what's the purpose of our organization so that will guide us in these difficult situations i think it's beautifully put the the other thing that i wanted just to test you about in relation to challenges uh, jana mentioned money well resources uh is a uh, can be people and money can't it and that uh resource challenges uh are often the thing that can trip up a well-worked plan. Um, do you, uh, from either CP or Europris point of view, have any resource challenges coming over the horizon? Yes, for sure. Uh, we since, since since the the pandemic, there has been a lot of turbulence uh, in terms of uh, living costs and and inflation, and uh, also salaries increasing. Uh, we also see. Um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, insecurity within uh, uh, the funding streams from the European Commission, for example. Uh, you have cutbacks in the, the Commission grants and the Commission funding. Uh, so there has been some, in, uh, let's say, uncertainty financially uh, the last couple of years. And uh, uh, that has been debated also internally in Europe just very recently. Okay. Uh, do you uh, want to comment on that, Jana? Well, it's just that, you know, uh, the same what happens to each of us as individual is also reflecting to every organization, like the cost of living, the cost of traveling is going very high. So you need to be more careful when, uh, when planning things and uh, uh, think about uh, how, how, how this will be possible and doable because the most important thing is no matter what you cannot lose the quality 
the quality needs to stay. So that is that is the crucial thing. You cannot say, well, the fonts are not good, so then we will lose the quality. No, then you need to do something. So sometimes you change from face to face to uh, online, uh, but you keep the quality. That's the crucial thing. That's really interesting. So do you see your organizations moving more online to cut down on the cost of travel and that sort of thing? No, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. It's just you need to be very practical and you need to see because traveling takes a lot of time. So you need to set uh, the difference between the meetings that really have added value if they are face to face or the things that actually you can reach the, the goal by having people online. And if it will be easier for participants for a shorter type of events or to have more people attending than the people that could travel, but this is something that is part of your strategy and you need to really think careful about this because we know that uh, both ways have uh, some really good sides and uh, this is why you really have to think about it. So the resources challenge in terms of use of time, Gustav, uh, virtual versus face-to-face, -face, what's Europe is doing about that? Uh, I would say that we are digitalizing a lot. Uh, so... Uh, Europe has started only actually Europe is, is the same age as my son I realize now <laughs> it's 12 years uh, this year and and he turns 12 just in a few weeks uh, and it started as a project so it was very much a activity based uh, organization uh, mainly focusing on on in person activities uh, and events so but the last couple of years were digitalized a lot and uh, we do more events online as well um, and also provide services on our website, uh, database, uh, practice sharing, etc. cetera. Um, so, so when it comes to, to, let's say, digital tools and, and uh, online presence, I think this has also added also expectations to, to our organization. So with these, with the accessibility, you get more expectations. So we are expected somehow to be present online. Uh, so, so I think uh, that's also something, speaking about emerging strategies, you need to adapt. And this is now an expectation that some of the events should be more accessible and also available online. So, so I think uh, that is something to take into the your, your account in plan. Yeah. And one of the challenges to the strategy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's move focus slightly because clearly at an international level, um, it's important to know who the key players are that you want to influence. So um, which organizations um, do you need to influence if you want to influence policy and strategy? Who would like to answer well, that question? Well, um, I think as we are a European organizations, then for us, of course, very important is European Union, especially European Commission. So uh, we are cooperating with them uh, very closely and uh, checking their priorities and needs and helping them to understand what's happening in the field in the European Union member states. And also there is a Council of Europe that we collaborate very closely, especially through the Council for Penological uh, PCCP. So this is something that is very important, both for CP and Europe, Riz, Gustav, if you want to add something. Uh, I think those are the two main bodies that we we collaborate with. Uh, I wouldn't say that we try to influence these bodies because there is a separation between our role as, let's say, representing the professional side of things and the policy making side. So, so it's more an interplay and the collaboration, and we support them in, let's say, uh, um, maybe. Uh, explaining sometimes how policy can actually be uh, implemented on the ground so to say and and how uh, um, the situation is in different countries so so it's uh, policy gets more relevant in a way so providing yeah. expert advice yeah would, would be we can say that we 
Yes, if I can add, we can say that we are a spokesman to these bodies, you know, and also we help disseminate their uh, important documents to our members, yeah. you know, so we, we assist to do this uh, network that goes two way. Mm. I, I, I'm wanting to challenge you a bit about that, because um, I think experts help set the agenda, Gustav. Um and surely that's part of a strategic function, that if you um, can see a problem coming because you're in the field, surely it's your job to alert the Council of Europe or the Commission uh, of a problem that's upcoming that your members are spotting. John, you're, you're completely right. I, I, I remember there is even a, in terms of uh, sociology and power relations, there is a very clear a method uh, on how to exercise power by agenda setting, as you say. So, so agenda setting is, of course, a, a way to influence policy in a way because you move the spotlight to different areas. Uh, so I, I completely agree that we have this power, if you call it that. We have the possibility to highlight different areas, but it's always emerging from the needs of our members or I can, it's empirically based always. So uh, we have now, for example, organized crime, international organized crime uh, in prisons uh, is uh, clearly a growing problem. And prisons has been excluded from uh, European strategies in general uh, when it comes to organized crime, which is uh, a mistake, I think, because uh, uh, most uh, convicted uh, high profile offenders end up in prison. And some of them keep committing crimes in prison and from prison. So, so uh, to include prisons in these strategies is uh, very important to to succeed. Uh, so, this is just an example uh, of a, of a let's say an, an topic and an area that we are now highlighting to to policymakers to to maybe that that needs more attention. So, yeah, you're completely right. Agenda setting is is a way for us to influence. Yeah, I, I mean, I, that's, again, really well put. And the the point is that crime has such a strong international component, whether it be uh, drugs or people smuggling or migration or um, uh, internet crime, for example, uh, the uh, material that's made internationally for sex offences, uh, if you're not grasping international components of crime you're letting your local communities down that's seems to me a strategic issue which uh has to be tackled uh, at supranational level and not just at community level so i i think the arguments on your side there was stuff I think. <laughs> thanks john thanks for your support uh, i just think that that also that uh, this is still, uh, uh, for, on a practitioner level, uh, sort of a fairly alien materia, you know, uh, like what, what does international cooperation, what, what does it, what has it to do with me, with my work? So this is something that we have to also promote and explain how the international, how internationalized everything is today. And that, uh, the transfer of a prisoner or a probation sentence uh, from one country to another it, it requires a lot of, uh, let's say, legal um, uh, legal support and 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 procedures, etc., to to actually happen. So th there are so much uh, international, um, also on the operational side, like Europol, Eurojust, uh, based here in the Hague, that that sort of are also on the operational level, working with uh, crime and to prevent crime. And until now, or at least in my view, uh, probation and prisons has been fairly excluded from this. So, so it's been more focusing on law enforcement, so to say. But I think that's a mistake. So uh, we need to be more involved in that part as well. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the average citizen uh, who thinks about it can see that there's a global economy mm. well i think there's a, a global aspect to criminality um crime isn't just what happens in your street but uh, maybe it's harder 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 to to take that aspect on board 
Okay. Um, I'm wanting to ask how CEP and Europris work to influence these big organizations. Uh, we mentioned the Council of Europe, which most people don't really understand, um, uh, and then the Commission. So how do you work to influence them? Or you, you mentioned supplying experts, but what is there anything else you do to influence them strategically? Well, we cooperate with them. We, uh, we, as I as I told you, we have this uh, duty and responsibility to be the bridge between the different organizations that are members, individual countries, and these uh, international big organizations. Because it's different when you talk with somebody bilaterally or when you have an international overview. So for us, it's very important to take part in different activities that are organized by European Commission or by Council of Europe and to share our knowledge. But we also include them, invite them to be part of our uh, different activities. This is very important. And as I highlighted, it's about uh, disseminating what is very important because there are always priorities. And then, um, for example, uh, if there is a, a new document regarding the uh, alternatives to pretrial detention coming from European Union, it's very important that it reach all our members, that we mention it in our events, on our social media, on our website. And for example, for the Council of Europe, uh, it was now uh, the, the last big uh, topic for the PCCP was about the mental health, the white paper. So, of course, we took a part in this, you know, sending the questionnaires to uh, member states, to checking different things in the field, how something functions, and of course, promoting the paper and the work on it. So there are a variety of activities where we work in the partnership that is uh, most important to highlight. So it's a give and take relationship from your point of view. Well, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, Gustav? Well, I'm completely in agreement with Jana. It's a, we, we are we're doing we are just on the same page in this sense. Uh, it's a it's a cooperation. I would say that's how we succeed, and to have let's say clarity of the roles of the different organizations. What do you think are the secrets of good collaboration between organizations? Well, uh, as I mentioned, I think the, having a clear sort of identity of your own role, uh, clear, clear, uh, uh, let's say, definition of what what is the purpose of your organization and what what are the limits. And for us, uh, let's say, driving policy has uh, not been included in our our mission, so to say. So we Europris is a practitioner based organization uh, where we can provide expertise to other organizations as well, but that's always sort of comes from the practice and our members. So, so I think that sort of having a clear idea, it's basically in any relationship, also personal relationships. I think the, the, the more sort of, the more and more uh, uh, safe you feel in your own role, the, the, the better you can relate to others, to be honest. Jana, what do you think the secrets I are? I, I agree with Gustav, of course, and I want to say it's also very important that you are professional and hardworking in what you do, because it's uh, it's also very important that we are reliable partner and that we are uh, open for sharing and for thinking and sometimes thinking outside of the box, you know, and uh, um, and being there. If there is a task, you need to be there and you need to know how to respond to it. Okay. I mean, you're both relatively recently appointed um, and you mentioned the importance of relationships. How, how did you, uh, to use the American term, reach out to uh, establish personal relationships with the, the key people? You know, for example, in the Council of Europe, did you know them people already or did you have to go and meet them for the first time? How well, do you know? Go okay, go Gustav. <laughs> Thanks, Jana. Uh, well, I mean, it, it's it's uh, it's it's um, of course depends a little bit on on let's say the handover from your predecessor. What kind of 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 uh, network was established already? 
uh, I had a pretty good handover when it comes to personal contacts. And I was also policy officer for Europress before the pandemic. So I had uh, some of these contacts myself, but I still think some of these organizations are fairly difficult to figure out how they operate and you sort of need to find your way. And uh, this is again, a uh, sharing, I think between CP and, and Europress that we sort of share like tips and tricks, like contact this person or they ask for you, you know, so you sort of help each other, support each other in, in connecting with the right people. So, so I think that's a, uh, so I'm always promoting CP uh, when I meet other stakeholders because we are sort of sister and brother in a way. Yeah. And same with the restorative thing. justice. The same with the restorative justice organization. Yes, they open because, doors for you too. Yes, we because we, as Gustav before said, we have this like a platform of the criminal justice Europe together with restorative justice, prisons and the probation. And I have to say very uh, similar, like Gustav, we really are brother and sister, like brother and sister organizations, that it's um, um, that it was super easy because I also had a nice period with, uh, with the former Secretary General, Willem van der Brug, who also uh, informed me about the context and we visited uh, some uh, persons to, uh, together. And um, it was also important to highlight that, uh, as I am uh, uh, some, I, I could say the usual suspect in the international probation world, I really knew a lot of people from before, from my role as an expert and the board member and vice president of CEP. So I didn't see any challenges in this. And of course, it's also good to have this good cooperation with other uh, organizations like Europris to share the knowledge and the names and the contacts. What's coming out very loud and clear from both of you is the importance of networking. And I'm going to say networking skills to strategic leadership. Would you agree? Yeah, I agree. I think uh, uh, when it comes to, to strategy, uh, what, what what sort of what is networking? Networking is not only connecting socially. Uh, networking is also has a professional component. I think always, so it's about relating your own uh, activities or operations to others' uh, activities and operations. And by doing that, you can sort of see op opportunities and limitations, maybe also in your own uh, reality, so to say. So I think networking is. It's important, but it's also very much a personal skill. So you can see a, sort of the full range when, when we have meetings or between, let's say, senior executives. Some are very sort of quiet and almost shy, <laughs> and others are very uh, outspoken. So you have the whole range, and maybe you have to approach these people a bit different, you know. So uh, you don't put the mic in the hand of, a, of a, one of the shyer uh, persons in a, in a big forum or a plenary, uh, rather maybe organize a face to face or a online chat, you know, individually. So you have to adapt also in your networking to to different characters and uh, also cultures. I would say around Europe because they are not the same. It's just like approaching offender. You need to, you need to have a holistic approach. <laughs> Exactly. Okay, we, we'll, 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 the wise listener will be writing that down as a note as well. So a variety of, uh, of approaches uh, to different cultures and different personalities as you build your network. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to change focus now to think more about strategic development and what might be coming over the horizon. So I've got a question here, which is about what do you think are the international priorities for strategic development in criminal justice over the coming three years. So who would like to start with that? Go, oh, yeah, well, how about you? Well, I can start, but I think this is one of the topics where, again, Gustav and I will share uh, the ideas. And it's uh, very much about the digitalization uh, these days. It's about uh, 
upcoming artificial intelligence and the different solutions that we might have. But also we cannot forget about the other uh, topics that are still relevant, like uh, radicalization and violent extremism. And of course, the mental health that is always important uh, for us. So uh, plenty of things to talk about in the forthcoming years. So those would be your three priorities. What are your priorities similar to that, Gustav, or different? Yeah, there is a certain overlap uh, in that sense. But I will I will just put as let's say t- top one priority uh, in in most prison services today is actually staffing. So staff recruitment, staff uh, retention, and staff well being is uh, they they are all connected and it's really a, a matter of survival you know for for these services so so i was me and jana we were uh, in a prison here uh, just a few months ago in the netherlands and they closed the whole wing because of lack of staff so this is really affecting uh, countries all over uh, and 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 i think this is uh, really about uh, this long term survival of an organization and meeting the objectives. So in terms of protecting the needs uh, and the rights of, of, of prisoners and probationers, I think staffing is will be crucial for the coming 10 years, I would say, because it's such a long-term issue. Yes, absolutely. I agree with Gustav and we already uh, had some activities that are uh, tackling this topic. We already started uh, thinking how to attract new people, how to make uh, working with the offenders more attractive, but there's plenty to do that we can uh, that we can still attract and that we uh, can really train a good staff for the future. And just, just to pick up on that, I think also that uh, this is a very typical example of emerging stra- strategy. So uh, when we are now forming our coming strategy for Europris, uh, staffing, of course, has been an issue before, but now it's that critical that maybe Europris has to enter, uh, let's say, a role of promoting working in prisons. So this is a completely new role for us to, to promote uh, prison work and prison as a profession it might be a little bit different for cp i don't know but for us it's it's it would be something new to actually showcase and 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 promote that we're working in a prison is a highly skilled job and very interesting and there's a variety of careers you can make within prison but that hasn't been our role so far but it could could really be that in a couple of years that we are more actively in in almost like promoting uh, working in prison uh, because the staffing crisis we see. Mm-hmm. And also spe- one topic to talk about is uh, being aware of the possible net widening and uh, to think about that in future, that we don't get more and more number of offenders, although the crime rates are not uh, raising so high. So people being sucked into the criminal justice system unnecessarily also something to think about okay um can i reflect on that staffing uh, question because i think there is um i'm going to say a, a supra national uh, strategic issue about staffing uh can i compare uh, the criminal justice system to the health system where a nurse and a doctor with their qualifications can very easily move between one uh, system and another, but a probation officer or a prison officer cannot move between one system and another. There isn't a sort of a systemic approach to staffing. And I wonder if there's a strategic challenge to us thinking more systemically about staffing. Do you think that's a strategic issue we could look at? Well, in some countries, these transfers are possible, in some are not. So this is also very individual in some countries. And uh, for example, uh, there was a multilateral meeting on uh, staff uh, 
um, recruitment and training in, in Strasbourg and Council of Europe. And many countries reported that they have problem uh, finding a new staff. And then we heard from Spain that they moved the training center uh, outside of the capital city inside and that they um, invested a lot to promote it as important role in the society. They also named the street after uh um, people working with the offenders and things like that, and they really raise the numbers of people interested in working. So it's also about uh, showing again the value of people and the importance of working with the offenders, because in in nowadays maybe it's important to highlight how important task this is and always to remind the, the decision makers that in the roots of working with the offenders is a human contact and that the staff is so important for our services and that we need to um, show the staff that we really appreciate they, yeah. their work. So we value a nurse but we don't value a prison officer. I would say that we, we, I mean, it's a good analogy, I think, uh, or bad, <laughs> depending on how you put it. But, but the the analogy with the doctor and the nurse is that the, these are true professions, and there are very few true professions globally. Uh, Jana is a lawyer; that's also a true profession. Uh, but in terms of transferability, there are very few professions where you can actually say there is this. Uh, uh, agreement, uh, you have these associations representing this profession, and it's globally agreed that these are the qualifications to be a lawyer or be a, 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 a physician, for example. So, so I, I think that's one of the reasons. It's, it's, it's quite. I mean, many professions are not uh, true professions in, in the theoretical, <laughs> uh, the say definition, but. Uh, there are uh, efforts being made to make a prison officer into a more clear profession. Uh, so there was a project just ended uh, called PO21, the prison officer of the 21st century, where we try to define within a, within a, a consortium of stakeholders, uh, defined more clearer curriculums and also uh, requirements for, for a for a prison officer. So there are efforts being done. And in terms of strategy, again, I think uh, the the with the globalization, with the Europeanization, so to say, uh, uh, to be able to work in different countries uh, as a prison officer or a probation officer, uh, that would be more common in the future. Mm, okay, so that's perhaps a strategic challenge to come. Oh, we're coming to the end of our time. So have you got any final thoughts on advice for leaders in your sector to help, help them keep a focus on the strategic dimensions of their job? So yes. let's start if with I can, I can say uh, for all the leaders, keep in your mind that there are no islands when working with the offenders. Together we are stronger, and for working with the offenders, this this really is all about. If we work together, we are more likely to reach our goals. We cannot work on our own, so our connection, our uh, being together, sharing the values, working together, will really help us to protect the society. And this is all what is about. We want to live happily and safe where we live. Thank you, Gustav. Yeah, I can, I can, I can definitely uh, agree on what Jana says uh, in terms of uh, also seeing the criminal justice chain and all its actors. You know, not forgetting about prison and probation at the end of the chain, and unfortunately, it's not even the end of the chain for many many offenders. They go back the chain several times. So. So I think that is a way to sort of stop this vicious circle is to include all these partners uh, in in the prevention of of, uh, of uh, offending actually, um, but uh, more generally when it comes to to strategy, I think that uh, it's it's important to to define the purpose of your organization and to dig deeper into your organization and see what's the background. Where do we come from, and what is what does this mean for the future? 
uh, you cannot create a, a strategy from scratch. You you always build on on history, so that's very important. Otherwise, you might end up in a with a strategy with no resemblance in in your your staff or your organization. Thank you, Gustav. Thank you, Jana. Um, you've shown us how important the big picture is. And I think it's time now to sign off. So thank you everybody out there for listening. We hope that you stay safe and hope that you can join us next time with an INCJ podcast. Goodbye and thank you very much. Podcasts are available on your normal provider via iTunes and Google under INCJ Podcasts. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.